Good morning. Welcome to our worship service for the second Sunday in Advent. The theme for worship today is repentance. Since Jesus coming, his Advent, because it is so certain what he does, as we're going to hear in our scripture lessons today, what he does is he sends out his messengers ahead of him to prepare the way for the Lord. O oh Lord, teach us your ways, that we may walk in your truth. You comfort and help us day by day. We trust in your loving care. You are the King of heaven and earth. We give you praise and thanks. Alleluia. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and his punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. We pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we turn to our scripture readings for this Sunday. Our first lesson this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40. We read verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call out to her. Her warfare really is over. Her guilt is fully paid for. Yes, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling out, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. In the wasteland make a level highway for our God. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The rugged ground will become level and the rough places will become a plain. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh together will see it. Yes, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice was saying, Cry out! And I said, What shall I cry out? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like a wildflower in the countryside. Grass withers, flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Yes, the people are grass. Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Get up on a high mountain, O Zion, you herald of good news. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson for the second Sunday in Advent is from 2 Peter chapter 3. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. For the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow to do what he promised, as some consider slowness. Instead, he is patient for your sakes, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be dissolved as they burn with great heat, and the earth and what was done on it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be? 
living in holiness and godliness as you look forward to and hasten the day, the coming of the day of God. That day will cause the heavens to be set on fire and destroyed and the elements to burn as they burn with great heat. But according to his promise, we look forward to new heavens and new, a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This is the word of our God. Our verse of the day for this Sunday, Alleluia, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Alleluia. Our gospel is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, this is how it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way for you. A voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He preached, One more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. What is Christmas? Family, parties, presents, some time for vacation. These are all things that we typically look forward to during Christmas. But if that's all that Christmas is to some people, I'm afraid that this is going to be a kind of a rough Christmas. In reality, Christmas is a message, isn't it? A message that comes through a person, God's Son, and it's announced by many people. God's people. In this beautiful portion of Isaiah that we're looking at this morning, several voices speak a message. When I read it a couple minutes ago, did you hear the Savior coming? The prophet Isaiah was God's prophet to the land of Judah. His ministry was about 60 years before the Babylonians took the people from the, the region of Judah into captivity. The first half of his prophecy, prophecy is it's filled with clear, stinging rebukes of coming judgment on both Judah and, and her enemies. Judah's defiant unfaithfulness to God. It would end in punishment, in discipline. It would end in bitter exile. But do you hear the Savior coming? When we turn the page to chapter 40, this kind of the second half of the book of Isaiah, God's mercy bursts into center stage in Isaiah's messages. Isaiah announces that the Lord still loved his people, even after all they had done to him. And can you believe it? He actually wanted them back. The hard times and harsh words, they would work repentance in his people's hearts. In captivity, they would have lots and lots of time to review the sins they had done, what they had done to bring themselves to that situation. They would have lots of time to see how they had defied and angered God. They would realize the painful truth that they had no one to blame but themselves for the consequences of what they were now suffering. They would feel completely alone, far away from, from the temple, separated from God, near despair. But like a, a mother or a father holds the sobbing child in, in their arms after they've been disciplined. And they hear the kids say, I'm sorry for disobeying. The Lord would put his arms around his disciplined 
repentant children. Dry your tears. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your hard service is over. Your exile, it's coming to an end. Your sins have been paid for, not by the years of exile, but by God himself. You've received double from the Lord's hand for all your sins. This reminds me of God saying, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. The picture of double for your sins almost sounds like double punishment, but it's actually the exact opposite. What the sins deserved is for the people of Israel to be cut off from anything good, but instead they would receive the double portion of inheritance, double good things, even though they were sinners. It's a message of God's grace. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. When, when George Frederick Handel composed his well-known masterpiece, the Handel, the Handel's Messiah, right? He began with these very words. The coming of the Messiah, it's a message of deep and abiding comfort. And not just for the people that were in exile, but for us too. These words speak to Christians everywhere. Our sins too have angered God. And he still uses the harsh word of his law to show us our sins. We too feel the pressure of a guilty conscience and the distance it puts between us and God. And we realize we have no one to blame but ourselves. We too often feel the hard servants, this hard service, the, the bitter consequences of our sins. Sin hurts. It hurts us. It hurts others. It puts strain on relationships where there ought not be strain. And when we sin, we, we reap what we sow. But do you hear the Savior coming? From eternity, God loved you and me. Centuries before we were born, he proclaimed an incredible message. A message of forgiveness and eternal life through the coming of of Christ, his appointed Savior. Our God has paid us back for our sins too, not with what we deserve, but with the opposite of what we deserve. Our God has given a full measure of mercy to cancel the guilt of our trespasses. Our, our sins are great, but his grace is greater still. God wants us to be doubly sure that our sins are really gone, really out of his sight forever. Seventy years after the Babylonians carried the Jewish nation away into exile, a thousand miles from their home, God allowed another nation, the Persians, to conquer those Babylonians in a sudden, stunning victory. In his very first year in power, the Persian king, a man named Cyrus, he ordered the release of the Jewish people and the rebuilding of their temple in Jerusalem. He even funded it. It all happened so quickly that it kind of took their breath away. Isaiah pictured it this way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. And the picture is God would waste no time in delivering his people. He would take a direct path straight to his people to deliver them. The normal route from getting from Jerusalem to Babylon was to go up and over because this was all wilderness in the middle. Again, that picture of God is going to take the direct route and quickly come and help his people. And this would happen because the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 700 years later, after Isaiah, another voice would fulfill this, proper, this, this prophecy in a far more glorious way. John the Baptist, as we heard in our gospel, he would come crying out in another wilderness, this time in the Jews' own homeland. The wilderness where the, the masses of, the, of religious leaders at the time had completely forgotten about the point of the religion. It was a religious wilderness. John the Baptist would come crying out in that wilderness that Christ, the Savior, was coming. By calling everyone to repent, Jesus was making a straight path into their hearts. He was delivering them from the captivity of sin. Then Jesus went straight to the cross. He suffered for the punishment of every sin. Suddenly, the glory of the Lord was revealed. And all mankind has seen it. Do you hear the Savior coming? 
it's a sad reality that many don't hear his message, will not hear his message of comfort. Especially during this time of year, it's such a busy time. People rush through the holidays, they get exhausted because they're always running around, their emotions, their money, everything's trying to manufacture joy. And then after the holidays, it collapses under the hard service of sin. Tragically, many completely miss the Savior and is called to find rest in him and the truth of the word being made flesh. That's why we hear another voice chime in with a message of concern from the Lord. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Do you hear the Savior coming? This is a hard message for us. Everything on earth, including our bodies, they're completely corrupted by sin. All of the beauty that, that we can manufacture, all the beauty that we can chase after, it's just on the surface and it's temporary. Like grass clippings that are fresh and green when you cut them. But then after just a few hours in, in the sun, they become dry and, and brittle. That's God's point of comparison with, with us. We, too, wither, we die. And we dare not place our hope in ourselves and what we have because it, it's going to end. The days and the weeks leading up to Christmas, they're a picture of that passing glory for a lot of people. It's easy for, for even us to get caught up, caught up in, the, in the sudden rush of the Christmas spirit, doing something nice, doing thoughtful things for others, spreading some, some Christmas cheer finding something good to celebrate before the end of the year. But then it's over. At the close of the season, the pieces of many lives are left kind of like debris on the shoreline when the tide goes out. And it's time to pick up all the pieces, all pick up after the parties, stash it away until next year. Right? As quickly as, it's, as it began, it's over. And for a lot of people, it's back to business as usual. Much of what seems important in our lives today will not matter a single bit on the day we die. It won't matter if we lived in a, in a dream house or, or in a mobile home, if we made lots and lots of money or just barely got by. It won't matter if we were the homecoming queen or, or the student that, that nobody noticed. It won't matter if we won that argument or found the man or woman of our dreams, the searing breath of the Lord blows over everything sinful and puts it under the curse of death. Moses wrote in Psalm 90, we are consumed by your anger. The wages of sin is and always will be death. Every single person that dies is proof that our bodies, that we are corrupt by sin. Mankind in all his glory is dying, physically, spiritually, eternally. On our own, we are nothing but dust. We cannot save ourselves from God's wrath. We can't devise a plan to escape it. And a lot of people are going to discover that fact too late when they face God's unavoidable judgment by themselves. The grass withers, the flowers fall. This is the picture of the human race. The word of our God stands forever. Nothing will keep God's law from being there to condemn sin. Our sin. But do you hear the Savior coming? You look at the look at the pronoun God uses here. The word is the word of our God. The God whom Jesus taught us to call our Father who promised that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The word of our God, it's more than just that stinging law, isn't it? The word of our God includes all of his faithful promises, and those promises stand forever. This is the word he fulfilled by sending the word, his one and only son to rescue us from, from eternal punishment. This same word has created faith in your heart, in the Savior who laid down his life as a ransom for you. 
Do you hear that Savior coming? Our lives are going to end. Our plans are going to cease. Our glory will fade. It's going to come upon us as every single person on this planet. But our hope isn't in ourselves or in our lasting legacy. Our hope is in God's unchanging word. And that hope is secure. And it makes it a word that, that gives us some tremendous confidence. We hear about confidence a lot in our times. Confidence in the, in the market, confidence in, in our politics. Well, with hard economic times, unemployment, rising prices, all kinds of related promises, some of them I'm sure we haven't even seen manifest yet, people are rightfully leery about these things. They have very little confidence in our political structure or in those who are leading us. Christians, you have a completely different kind of confidence, one that cannot be shaken. Because no matter what is going on in our world, we always know how life turns out, don't we? Jesus is going to come back to take us from this world of sorrow, and he's going to take us to himself in heaven. He's going to come to us in love and in joy. As one who longs to be with Jesus, put yourself in this picture. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the picture of your Savior and how he looks at you. Do you hear the Savior coming? He's coming for you and for me. And by God's grace, that isn't a scary picture, but it's the exact opposite. Our lives are going to end, but they're going to end in the shelter of Jesus' love. And they're going to continue on forever in the company of his presence. Until then, we can be certain that our shepherd, our good shepherd, the one who laid down his life for us, he's going to continue to guide us. He's going to continue to bless us. He's going to continue to protect us. Christians can be confident that if God is for us, no one can possibly be against us. No one can bring any charge against us because God has forgiven us. Nothing and no one can separate us from his love. And all things have to work together for our good because he loves us. Do you hear that Savior coming? It sounds like a message almost too good to be true. Definitely too good to keep to myself. It sounds like a message so many others need to hear. It sounds like the Lord is calling me and you confidently to share it, doesn't it? The last couple of verses of our reading from Isaiah this morning, I'll read those in closing. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. Amen. We pray. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries you repeated and you affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the coming, to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride, to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and our strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the faithful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines, from the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, 
but as the Lord of Lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. You have taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty, merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and preserve us. Amen.